You might already know that Russia and the U.S. are separated by the ridiculously short distance of just 51 miles 80 to kilometers at the Bering Strait, which divides the two largest land masses on the planet. However, the actual distance between the two countries is only 2 miles 3 kilometers, as there are two islands in the middle of the strait, each belonging to one of the countries. On rare occasions during winter, the ocean water freezes, forming an ice bridge that allows people to literally walk from one country to the other in just about half an hour. However, in this video, we won't be talking about short steps on ice, but about how, for decades, these two superpowers have been planning to build a gigantic bridge not to connect the islands, but to link the continental masses of Asia and North America. This would allow people to drive from London to Patagonia, thanks to climate improvements in the area driven by global warming. This project is closer than ever to becoming a reality. I just mentioned that this bridge would connect the continental mass of Russia or Asia with that of the United States or America. If I hadn't clarified the islands, we might assume they belong to their respective continents and that the bridge would actually be between them, which isn't true. The truth is, it's very difficult to define what a continent is, what an island is, and what each belongs to. We need to clarify this before moving forward with one of my favorite examples of incredible landforms. This is Vulcan Point, a very cute and peculiar island because it is located in a lake. Within the crater of a volcano, which in turn is an island in a much larger lake located on Luzon. Another island that houses the capital of the Philippines, Manila. Unfortunately, as if the coronavirus wasn't bad enough, in January of this year, an eruption of the volcano swallowed the inner lake, destroying Vulcan Point as well. It's interesting because Google Maps has already updated the topography, but the satellites haven't had time to take new pictures. Fortunately, a few months ago, a person with the hobby of finding extreme natural coincidences like this, me found Vulcan Point's substitute in Canada, a series of islets in a lake located on an island and you know how the story goes. In any case, it has the same number of islands within islands as Vulcan Point and currently holds the world. Record. However, there are likely many more islands of this type scattered across the planet. Or maybe even some with a fourth level of island nesting. Waiting for some curious person to find them on Google Earth. Who knows, that someone could be you. But how far can we go? Aren't continents just giant islands? Where are the limits of small and large? How big does a rock protruding from the sea have to be to be considered an island? And why is this considered an island and not something else? I mean, Greenland is much larger than Australia. Yet Australia is considered a continent under the name Oceania, while Greenland is considered a simple island. But are you sure that's right? On the 36th of which you can compare the sizes of the world's land masses. The link is in the description. It's curious to see how big Mexico looks when moved to Europe or how small Spain appears. When shifted to the tropics, this happens because it's impossible to project the spherical Earth onto a flat surface without distortions, which, for purely pragmatic reasons, were allowed in areas closer to the poles. Since fewer people live there, 
making these regions less important if they're distorted at least. So, if we drag Greenland over to Australia, we can see that Australia is indeed much larger than the polar island. And suddenly everything makes more sense. In fact, according to international conventions, Greenland is the largest island on Earth, followed by the continents, for convenience's sake. Without any evident scientific reason that allows us to draw a clear line between what is a continent and what is an island. Below it are New Guinea and Borneo, while the smallest island is. Well, that's more complicated. There's just room enough island in New York State, the smallest inhabited island in the world. As for the actual smallest island on the planet, it changes with every passing millisecond since the world's coastlines are filled with tiny rocks that stick out of the water just a few millimeters. So with the rising sea levels, there's a new island submerged and a new candidate every moment. As you can see, the definitions of continents and islands are very ambiguous, subjective, and even, I dare say, synonymous, at least from certain perspectives. Even science itself doesn't agree. But what happens if we look at it strictly through a geological lens? To do that, let's use a combination of two maps. The first, the famous tectonic plate boundaries. The different blocks of rock that make up the Earth's crust. And the second, a map showing the topography of the entire planet. Include by that, I mean a global elevation map. Or in other words, a relief map as if there were no water on the planet. What stands out here is the difference between what's called continental crust and oceanic crust. The two major types of rock on a very large scale that make up the planet's outermost layer. As you can see, continents correspond with the highest areas, which are made of continental crust. While oceans align with the lower areas made of oceanic crust, these can be easily distinguished by elevation, and it turns out that, in general, they also have quite different chemical compositions. The problem lies in the light blue area's continental crust that's just below sea level. This is why the world's beaches aren't steep cliffs plunging into the abyss. But instead, they slope down gradually until they reach the deep sea, the true edge of the continental shelf. What happens is that depending on the sea level, parts of this blue area can emerge and be considered part of the continent, and vice versa. One of the regions where this phenomenon has occurred most recently in the planet's history is precisely the Beringer Land Bridge, or in other words, the area of submerged continental crust beneath the Bering Strait. Until about 11,000 years ago, this was the state of things, with America and Asia completely united, forming a supercontinent. This natural, gigantic bridge was what allowed humans to cross the strait and populate the Americas. Had it not been for this bridge, it's possible that humans might not have reached the continent until European conquest. So, while we could consider continental crust as the true boundary between continents, it turns out that practically all of the planet's continents are connected by these blue areas that sometimes emerge and become part of the land. However, there are small cracks that aren't visible on this scale, but can help us draw the boundaries. This is where the second map, with the tectonic plate boundaries, comes in. The truth is, it doesn't look bad at all. A few small continents or new plates emerge, but generally, 
All traditional continental boundaries are maintained and align with both the continental crust and plate boundaries, except for one exception, the one we're interested in. The Bering Strait doesn't have any plate boundary. Eastern Eurasia actually belongs to the North American plate. However, it's precisely this seemingly irrelevant context that makes the construction of the Great Bridge feasible. If there were a plate boundary in the strait, the terrain would be very unstable and dangerous. And if it were very deep, it would be too expensive to work on. So, sticking to the traditional definition of a continent as a large landmass that you can drive across. Continuously, let's see how these countries plan to build the bridge that will revive the supercontinent that once allowed humans to reach the Americas. The Diomed Islands are a key point. Between them lies not only the border, but also the international dateline, which marks the point where the days begin. In the few minutes it takes to travel from one island to the other, you can either go back or forward 24 hours in inter- Additionally, the islands would serve as the perfect support points for the bridges. For all these reasons, the administrative border, customs, maintenance, and management would be located on the Diomedes. Surprisingly, the area wouldn't be too hostile for the bridge or its construction. As the maximum depth in the strait is only 180 feet 55 meters, and the tides and currents in the area are very calm, the only problem would be the cold and darkness during the winter months. The idea is to build a bridge from the American coast to Little Diomed Island, the American one, which is inhabited. Then another small bridge connecting it to Big Diomed Island, the Russian one, mostly uninhabited, which would be traversed by a tunnel since it's very high, and finally, a stretch from the Russian island to its mainland 80 kilometers of bridge in total. 40 kilometers each. The Donghai Bridge, the world's longest sea crossing bridge, measures 30 to kilometers. So technologically speaking, we're not that far off. The total estimated cost of the project, including the construction of a bridge that would allow cars, trains, and pipelines to pass is $100 billion three times the cost of the Channel Tunnel or ten times the cost of NASA's Future James Webb Telescope. Yes, it's a lot of money, but not unreasonable when considering that this bridge would create the greatest trade route in history, right? Well, that's not so clear. The Russians have been the strongest proponents of the idea, having started several projects leading up to the bridge's construction, which mainly involve bringing human infrastructure to the Russian coast, which is completely uninhabited for hundreds of square miles. Lately, China has also been getting involved in the project, but with some reluctance. The problem is that it's cheaper and more efficient to transport goods from California and Panama to China and Russia directly by ship. Additionally, the poor and often non-existent infrastructure on both sides of the strait further complicates the viability of the plan. But in the coming years, the paradigm will likely change as the scarcity of fossil fuels will make it increasingly unfeasible to transport goods on massive ships, making road transport with electric trucks more cost-effective. Moreover, global warming will make the planet's northernmost regions more hospitable, giving a strong boost to infrastructure development in the area. Therefore, it's quite likely that in the coming decades, 
we'll witness the construction of this colossal and spectacular engineering project, which in a way, will resurrect the ancient continent of your America, which in the past already allowed humanity to flourish across the planet.